Okay, so yeah, I'm Mike Sterrick. I'm a Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, and I'm with the uh, Geographic Information Science and Geospatial Survey and Engineering Program. So what I'm going to do is really just give more an overview, actually not so much on the applications that we're working on, but more on how we're using these UAS or drones uh, for mapping. So what are the products we get out? And then you're going to see some great presentations following that, and as you saw with Dr. Lanivar, on how that data is being used. So it's really kind of on you know, how do we use these sensors and what data do we get out of it? And then that's the kind of stuff that goes into these crop heights, these growth rates, and that kind of information. Um, so a little overview on U.S. platforms, the basic types, if you're not familiar. So this is a very broad summary. And then the data acquisition, which we'll see later this afternoon. So some of the things we have to think about when we fly and collect data with UAS or drones. And then the main focus here is the image processing software. This is probably equally as important as the development of autonomous technology in terms of mapping, anyway, and what we're doing with this for Precision Ag. Um, some examples of data products, and then I'll end with sensor types. Um, I'll try to move through it pretty quickly. Uh, we've got about 25 minutes. So we'll, um, but real quick, if you're not familiar, there's basically two broad categories of uh, unmanned aircraft systems. You have your fixed wing and your rotary craft. Uh, now, the advantage of the fixed wing really is the basic guys are a little bit more efficient. Right, they generate lift through the wing, high pressure below, low pressure above, they fly. So the real advantage there is generally they're better at longer endurance per a given battery. So all things being equal, you can get longer flight times. So they're better at mapping in larger areas. Downsides are you need room to launch and land. Um, rotary craft are just like helicopters, propellers. Uh, generally, they can't carry as much paint wing, all things being equal. Um, good for endurance. However, they typically are more adaptable. They can handle higher winds better. They're more stable. You can. Uh, Hover, you can fly lower. So one of the big advantages is you can really fly lower with the rotary craft. Vertical takeoff and landing. So you're here, you're here a term called VTOL um, right here. So that's what they're talking about. Now these, these lines are getting blurred because the technology is really progressing so fast in terms of that. But that's the basic idea. And then in terms of the types of platforms at least we're working with, uh, the FAA classifies small unmanned aircraft systems as less than 55 pounds. That's platform plus payload. That's everything. Takeoff weight. I mean, we're really talking about, I'd say generally, like the DJI Phantom's a pound or two at most. I mean, that's really where a lot of the market is getting pushed in terms of just collecting data. Um, again, there are different kinds. So there's mixed ones and hybrid platforms. This is one that actually is a vertical takeoff, then transforms into fixed wings and starts to fly. So there's a lot of commercial systems coming out mixing these types. Um, and then the one big thing we can do with these is in terms of advantages, there's efficiency, right? We can generally go out and fly them over time. Um, we can zoom in at really high resolution. So as an example, here's a Google Earth 60 centimeter, um, pretty high resolution. It's actually from a satellite image um, we can get from space. Four centimeter UAV, but we can get down to four millimeters if we want with these rotaries. So just an example of this. Um, the downsides with uh, uh, drones right now, really, in terms of what Dr. Linovar mentioned, is the scale there. Endurance is a big limitation, as well as regulations. Um, so even if we could fly thousands of acres, um, that's some of the limitations. But really the big one is just the, the endurance right now, where a satellite imagery we can map huge, huge acres. So um, it's getting there. So as an example platform, we'll see an example of this one later this afternoon. This is called an EB, but all these uh, drones have kind of similar technology um, on board them. Uh, so the main thing you would have would be a measurement unit that measures the orientation as it's flying. That's really for navigation. You have an onboard GPS system to measure its location so you can plan your flights and we'll see some planning as it flies. So that information is really used to navigate. They also have things like a magnetometer that gets its heading uh, to magnetic north so it can, it can go. It has altimeters for, for altitude as well. So there's all these different sensors to navigate really. What we do for mapping purposes is we're really concerned with really the positioning information uh, from the GPS on board that aircraft. Most of these systems have very low grade GPS, but very accurate, maybe five meters if you're lucky. They're not what we would call survey grade. However, I'll show some examples where we can, we can equip them with better uh, GPS technologies that can get more accurate than that. But what we're trying to do really is grab that information and tag them to these different sensors we put on. And by sensors, most of what we're using are just your just typical off-the-shelf digital cameras. You might be able to put a filter in them, modify them, capture near infrared. There are more advanced, um, some examples later today, a really good what we call miniaturized sensor that captures a lot of different bands from near infrared to visible. Um, as an example, you can launch them different ways. Here's the EB where you shake it and let it go. And again, we'll see some demos later today uh, with this one in particular, and as well as rotary craft with uh, Dr. Joan. So data acquisition. Um, so real quick, we'll, we'll, again, we'll do a demo later today. We have to think about, at least when we're talking about trying to pull out geospatial data or GIS data to map with it. Um, the biggest thing is image overlap. 
And again, I'm going to get to the, the, the technology behind take this information and map with it. But what you have to do is you have to overlap your imagery, um, what we call forward lap. So as you're flying along, and then side lap. As you do flight lines back and forth, a bunch of overlap. So these images need to open different ways um, because what it's going to try to do is map different images to then figure out three-dimensionally where things are on the ground. So we call that reconstruction. But the trick with that is you have to define your overlap. Now, the thing is, the more you overlap, that often is good. Um, however, of course, the more you overlap, the longer the flight time. And again, with these UAS systems, there's always a trade-off in endurance. Um, so you have to kind of juggle it around. But typically, you want 60 to 7 overlap, side lap, in lap when you fly these things, when you want to pull out 3D data. Now, the other big factor when you plan your missions, and again, you have this flight planning software. And I'll show an example here, and we'll see it in our demo. Um, but one f other factor, so you would define your overlap, side lap, in lap, and then you'd also want to set your, your resolution. So for example, you might have some agronomist or crop science say, hey, I want five millimeter resolution. You're like, okay, that's really high. Um, so the, 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 what determines that is really your camera. It's called your focal length, uh, which is just a property of each, each sensor and lens on a camera. And then uh, the size of your sensor, by that I mean the physical dimension of a pixel inside the sensor. So very, very small micrometers. So you have a 20 megapixel sensor, maybe it's one inch, then you could figure out what's the size of one individual sensor, however that works. Um, and then the altitude, the flying height. So depending on your focal length and your flying height, of course, the higher you fly, the bigger your actual ground sample distance, which is just the size of your pixel on the ground, the lower you fly, the smaller it gets. So when you're flight planning software, you would say, okay, if I needed five millimeter resolution, I have a camera with this focal length and sensor size. Software then can allow you to say, okay, you need to fly 100 feet above the ground to get at that as average resolution. So that's another thing that we think about when we do mission planning. So as an example, there's many different types of uh, planning software. There's open source software and different tools. Uh, this is one example here of mission planning software that we use of our systems. And again, what you would do is you plan your flight lines over your area, and then it's using that GPS on board and all this information um, to collect this data. So we would plan our flight lines. We would say, okay, we want 75% overlap. We want to fly at this altitude. We can enter that information, and then what happens is from that, we can design our flights, launch it, and what it'll do is it'll just navigate and go and collect this data and try to acquire this imagery at these resolutions. Um, one other important factor, as I mentioned, when you design these missions, as a, it's important, and I mentioned that a lot of these UAS, especially DJI Phantoms and things, don't have very good GPS. I mean, they work for navigation, but when I want to put something within a few centimeters, not a few meters, uh, the onboard GPS, for these systems generally isn't that great. So you have two options. You can either try to adapt your, your drone and put on a better a GPS system. Um, we can use techniques like differential GPS and try to correct it, which is a little more challenging. Or we do a thing called, uh, we put out uh, ground control networks or control targets, just like we did with traditional aerial surveying. We're really doing nothing different than what we did with aircraft. We're just using these little autonomous platforms to do it. So as an example, we were mapping along this road ground control targets. So if I was mapping this whole area, this would be really bad layout of targets. I would want targets on the corners and in the middle. But basically, you distribute these targets on the ground that we can identify in the imagery. And here's an example here. Inside today, ground control networks that we use when we fly out here. And then what we'll do is we'll go survey them in with really accurate GPS down to a few centimeters of positional accuracy. That way, when we collect this data and we throw it in our software, and then we can geo-reference them, not or you know five to ten meters where they should be, uh, but down to you know two, three, four, five centimeters, and then that allows us over time to line our imagery over time very, very accurately. And that's critical when we're looking at growth rates for crop heights and things like that. This is the kind of stuff in the background that goes on that we have to do just to get good data. Um, and here's an example of of these images. Um, inside the software, so we can go in and tag them and find them, or you can automate how that works. Another thing, you depending on where you're working, if you have things that are identifiable in the image, um, you can find them. You can go out afterwards, for example, here when we fly our campus, um, we go and we, have, we collect on just identifiable features in the image that we can get coordinates on and then use that um, and geo-reference the data more accurately than what we get up our Jeep. And then as mentioned, I won't spend much time here, but there are us, and one, one really good way is instead of just doing that, if you can figure out your position at each time you capture that image and you can figure, uh, you can geo-reference it very, very accurately, then that solves this problem a lot. And one, one technique is what we call RTK, or real-time kinematic. The basic idea is you would have a GPS on the ground, you set up overnight, and then what it does is it's recording and looking at the errors where it thinks it is, and then it takes and it measures, okay, I was two inches this way, I should, and it measures that error, and then it sends a correction to the drone as it's flying, and it'll recorrect its GPS position, and that way when you tag the images where they're located, you can do it more accurately. Um, so these are things, there's different ways to do it. 
uh, but there's other technologies that go into this. But again, the whole idea with this is when you plan your missions, you want, at least in our case, you know, five meter accuracy position, five centimeters. We can overlay that over time, look at the crops growing, um, and keep that consistent. So it's a very important part of it. And real quick, another thing when you're flying these, as we'll see in Lone Star talk about, is visual observers. Why do you need them? Um, this is my only UAS joke I always show. <laughs> undergrad students is why you need them. So never underestimate the power of visual observers. Not to, not <laughs> these are some of my own students. Yeah, it happens all the time. So we're going to have a lot of visual observers. But anyhow. Um, <laughs> so real quick now, for a little bit of time, let's see what I have here thing here is the image processing. So what we do is we fly, we plan our missions. We'll see this later today. We're going to go through some demos and kind of look at actual mission planning software um, or mission uh, flight planning and go collect data. But the, I think with what we're doing with mapping, there's some software behind it. And so what we're using is a technique called photogrammetry. So any students here know what photogrammetry means? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Well, photogrammetry. So it's basically taking cameras, and we're just trying to map with it. So we're basically just measuring 3D with cameras. So there's different ways to measure three-dimensionally. All we're doing is taking 2D images, but what we're able to do is overlap by overlapping a bunch. What's the key with, with when we acquire this data is we can take those images, and what's pretty amazing to me is we can go from a raster or 2D image to 3D coordinates. I can measure you. I can get you three-dimensionally. I can measure your size, heights, shapes of this room strictly by just using cameras. Now, there's a lot behind it. But this is a real revolution in terms of this technology and from computer vision to photogrammetry that got coupled with how to, to be able to then all of a sudden start collecting GIS data at massive rates, mapping in 3D. To me, this was just, when I was in grad school, you know, this was impossible. I mean, there were things out there to do it, but the computing wasn't there. So it's pretty incredible to me what's happening. So how does it all work? Again, it's just photogrammetry, but the term we use um, in this field, it's a type, a special type of photogrammetry. They call it structure. So, um, the reality is you really don't want any motion on the ground, so it's really, they call it structure from as you're moving, you're overlapping, uh, acquiring a bunch of different images um, as it overlaps of the scene. But what you don't want is as you're flying over an area, it's really bad actually to have things moving around. So you want things as static as possible except for the drone as it's capturing the image. But the basic idea behind structure from motion or structure from motion photogrammetry, SFM, this is the term, and this is what the software and what we use to produce these crop heights and all this information. Um, is what you're going to do is just acquire, as an example here, you could just take a camera and I could sit here and snap pictures of y'all like this. As long as I can overlap it enough, what I can do then is find between where these different features or pixels that correspond between this, this camera position here and this camera position here. And then physics say the light rays have to intersect. So if I can figure out where they intersect, I can then go back and reverse and say, okay, well, they intersected here and here, so then the camera must have been here, the camera must have been here, and I could reconstruct where the camera was located, and, and then I can go back reverse again and actually say, okay, well, now I know where these things are. I can figure out now where these pixels were in 3D in the real world. As long as I know this position of the cameras, the GPS information in the real world, I can then three, magically map in 3D real world information. So what we're doing with this is we're just simply putting these cameras and sensors on board, doing the same thing, but we're using the UAS or the drone to acquire the data and overlap. Um, and then we can interpret or recreate a 3D model of the scene. So that's the real power behind it. You get motion photogrammetry if you're brand new to this and haven't seen it. The big product, really the base product you get is what we call a dense textured 3D point cloud. There's different clouds, but this is through the structure for motion photogrammetry. This is actually a survey we did of a beach about nine miles long in Little St. George Islands, Florida back in March. At over a thousand points, by a thousand points I mean if I went and took a GPS within one meter square area, I have a thousand measurements very, very accurately if I do it right. Very, very dense data. And so what I could do is I can get the elevation, I can get the heights of the trees, I can fly again, I can look at how these things change. So the base product with this in tech, 3D point cloud, texture just means if I had an RGB camera, um, so red, green, and blue values, so the, the pixel value, the brightness values, it just means that at that point I could assign the red, green, and blue brightness value just like I get in a pixel to that point. So that's what they, if I had near infrared information, I could assign an NIR value to that. Um, but the real base product of structure for motion is just as we can do, and you'll see a lot of examples here, is we can take this and do a lot of stuff with just measuring how the land forms, the vegetation, and things grow and change and evolve. So to give you an idea of the software behind this, and we'll see some examples, and I'll mention some of the main software, um, they have specific circ workflows. They're all very and how they set them, but structure for motion has these kind of same 
basic things it does um, in this software, and then the way they, they integrate them and do it is kind of different, but all, all the software kind of follow a similar type approach to do this photogrammetry. And again, the real power with this is it'll figure out where you, I don't actually have to put GPS into my cameras. Uh, it, would, it could figure it out. It could figure out its relative orientation. It just want to be very accurate if I went and try to bring that data into Google Earth. It does, it'll figure out your camera positions, calibrate your cameras, figure out if there's anything wrong with the focal length, all this at once, and then reconstruct and map in 3D. So how it does it is when you throw all these images, you collect a sequence of images with your drone, you throw it in, what it's going to do is search through all your images and find what we call features. Features are things are unique in all the images. Then the next step is it goes through this automated feature correspondence. What is an image B overlapped? Okay, these 10 features here match these. And it goes through thousands of images and does this. So it's very computational. So it starts to match those features. That's how it can then figure out where things correspond and reconstruct the camera positions. Once it can do this, then what it does is re reconstructs camera pose. Pose just means position and orientation of the camera. So each image that was acquired will use this information to go back and figure out where that stuff is located. And once it, do, it does that, it can then generate what we call a sparse 3D point cloud. That means actual measure on the ground as though we mapped it. And then the final stage is this thing called that does is it can't match everything here and all the pixels, so it has an algorithm that goes through and then kind of densifies and makes your point cloud denser and gets more measurements out of it. And the bottom line, and then from that we can create digital surface models and we create what's called orthomosaics, and I'll explain that here in a minute. So just real quick as an example, here's a bunch of weird features that these algorithms would do, the computer science folks, between two overlapping images. And then what it does is it finds them and draws them together. Now it would do this through thousands of overlap. And then ultimately what would happen, here's an example over a beach at our university, would figure out the camera position orientation. This is showing where the GPS said it was and where the algorithm figures out where it was. And you can see here on the ground, these are actual measurements or points on the ground that form that point cloud. But notice here, this is actually a road. See how there's no points here yet? So what happens is the next stage is that densification would fill these in and find more data. And so as an example, um, here's along a beach, you just get more points. So the, all this software will go through these different stages and do this um, to, to pull this out. So as an example of how this would work, and again, we'll, in terms of ag data, we would take in this imagery. So in this case, near infrared, green, blue, throw it through the software, it would figure out you know, the positions of the camera and all that. Well, you know, is this point cloud and all this differ different information. So we get this 3D point cloud. We could create a digital surface model. So that's just the elevations from those points. We can also get what's called a reflectance map. So if we had near infrared, red and green, or green and blue, we could pull that out. And then what happens is we now have structure information. So that's the crop heights, that kind of. We also have the spectral information. So we can do things like NDVI and look at crop stress um, and health and how, how it varies all in this beautiful workflow to just that photo. Amazing. So the software will kind of go in all in one and then we get the base products are these here and then we can do things with them for the analytics on the down. So you'll see a lot of examples of this coming up of the kind of amazing things that can be done. Um, if you're not familiar with this, some of the main software that are used for this, so there's many different kinds, but probably the two biggest commercial ones, the ones we utilize between our group at Texas A&M Corpus Christi anyhow is Pix4D. Um, we like it a lot, and then PhotoScan uh, as well, Agisoft PhotoScan with Dr. Jung Lights, and we use both of these. These are two very good, powerful commercial software. They're very user friendly, they're flexible. That can produce your point clouds, your digital surface models, your orthomosaics. This is what we do with the drone processing. There's also an open source, there's some different ones, but Open Drone Map's the most common one. This is free. The is it's not nearly as powerful or flexible as these. Um, it's maybe not as good if, for example, we're surveyors or we care about accuracy, so it maybe isn't great for that. But you can do some nice things with stitching imagery together. But any software that we use, uh, but these two are the biggest commercial ones widely used type of stuff. So again, we throw it through this, this routine. We pull out this information. So to give you an idea again of the products that we would get out of this, in which we'll see the 3D point cloud. The big thing, as I mentioned, all this, this is colored by height. So again, those are geo-referenced X, Y, Z, you know, latitude, longitude, positional coordinates plus their height. So that means the elevation of all these points. And so again, this example is colored by height. What we can do then is we can take those point clouds. So here's an example here. We can do things like filtering. That means I could say, okay, I don't like the vehicles and things in it. I can use some algorithms out. I could say, I just want to find points that are the ground. And I could take those ground points and try to reconstruct the ground surface and then points off the trees and the canopy um, and reconstruct the tops of that. So what you can get from those point clouds, we can get what's called a digital surface modulation of all the points on tops of buildings, trees, here crops, 
and then wherever there's exposed ground. And then if we had a uh, case where we could strip away those points and just get the ground points, or maybe we fly before vegetation is growing out here and we get a barrier surface, we can take that and create what we call a digital elevation model, which by that I mean the bare exposed ground, the elevation below it. And so as an example here, some of the work we're doing at Forge, just some of the base products. We have a digital surface model here. We then worked on some algorithms to try to strip away points from vegetation. Um, we could take the difference between this and this to look at canopy heights and things like that, and we'll see an example here. At the end, we can make, create slope maps and other things like that. So this is just GIS products that we get, but now we're doing it with you know, $200 cameras, autonomous systems, and getting very, very valuable data that used to be very expensive to do and very detailed. So that's a real power with this technology. Um, again, I magnified Mosaic. This is a very that we get from the software. And what that is, is a, so here's a bunch of imagery. The first thing you can do is you take that image, you can stitch them together and mosaic them. What orthorectified means is that it corrects for distortion. It corrects for distortion from the terrain and also from the camera. And how it does that is it uses that point cloud data and creates a digital surface model and it uses that information and then correct the terrain distortion. And so the big thing with an orthorectified mosaic, what that really means is that an image has a bunch of distortion. So I can't take a scale. One foot here equals one mile on the ground in this image. Another part of an image from a vertical image, that might be one foot equals 30 miles up here, one foot equals 10 miles down here. So I can't use it to measure things accurately. So the beauty of this software is it uses all that information, it takes it and corrects for that. So what I get out of it is this nice what we call an image map. I can take this orthorectified mosaic, go in my GIS, and now I can accurately measure distances, areas, volumes, et cetera. Um, very, very powerful. And again, it gets it about it all works together in this nice seamless workflow. Use this spectral information and the 3D point cloud for the structural and get this information out of it. So as an example, here's Weld or Wildlife Refuge. A thousand images or this together to make one big, we can go on the GIS and uh, look at different things. So just zooming in here, um, this is about one inch pixel, so about one inch ground sample distance. So that's a resolution for a drone sample. Plenty for what we used to get. And again, zooming in. With the little bit of time I have left, I'll cover a little bit on sensors. So again, the software is a real powerful thing about it, but what's also cool about this is the technology and sensors, is the miniaturized sensors. They're getting, you know, we're making smaller and smaller sensors that we can put on things like D um, and different things like that. So we're really talking about cameras here, or passive imaging sensors. So the two main kinds, for typical camera, what we're really measuring is just reflected energy. So we're measuring sunlight coming in reflecting in the red, green, and blue visible part of the spectrum. And then for crop stress, near infrared is the big one. So we have sensors that go out to near infrared, short wave infrared. Right, so again, they're kind of measuring light coming in, reflecting off. And we have many different levels of sensors now that are lightweight and fit on these small drones um, that we can equip and basically capture this type of data. Now, what happens is we move out to these longer wavelengths. We get in towards the 8 to 14 micrometers. Um, we get into what we call long wave infrared. This is actually the thermal part. Now we have thermal sensors. So that's not where light's coming and reflecting off, but actually that's where most of us, we here in this room, are radiating out. We're just like suns ourselves. We're heating sunlight and energy coming in, but we have to radiate that energy back out or we would overheat and you know, things would happen. So we tend to radiate energy bandwidths here within that range. And so a thermal sensor is looking at that, and that's the idea of the sensors that we can relate thermal energy to temperature. That's what we're working at there. So we can take this. These are tricky sensors. You need bigger sensor frames. You can't miniaturize them quite like RGB. We don't have 20 megapixel thermal cameras at this size now. We have 600 by, you know, 360 or 4, whatever the size is. Very, quite a bit different because we don't enter, radiate nearly as much energy as the sun coming in. But amazingly, they're getting smaller and smaller, and we are able to equip them on very UAS and capture not only reflectance, but emitted energy, um, which is incredible. So that's the kind of things we're taking. So an example of thermal imagery, some wild game showing off that emitted energy, so hotter relative to the cooler background. In terms of spectral resolution, if you're not familiar in remote sensing, very generally you'll hear multispectral. So multispectral just means you know from one band to a red, green, and blue camera, three band, maybe out to 20 is what I would consider multispectral. It just means you know you could have blue near infrared, short wave infrared, medium wave infrared, etc. So here's an example of a sensor here called the Sequoia. Um, it's got near infrared, red edge, which is a little bit closer to red, red and green, all in one, plus a little RGB camera. It's about this big. We'll see an example later of a miniaturized sensor. And then moving up in the space, you could have what's called hyperspectral sensors. These can measure, you know, 100 bands to 1,000, say between 
Blue wavelengths in red, very small little slithers of light. They're getting there. Um, they're more expensive. Um, some people say it can be information overload. But you can get a valuable amounts. Of, so here's what we call a data cube of just going across, say, at this location on the ground, all across these different wavelengths. And so you get a more continuous of information. But all this technology is really, because of the miniaturization of these sensors, it's getting there and there and there. And pretty soon, these will probably be commonplace for these small US that we can equip on them. So as an example, um, we take them. There's a lot that goes into integrating these sensors. Um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. When you're talking about mapping, the real trick is trying to get that imagery accurately located with the GPS and time tag and all this stuff. But, but what's cool about, about the UAS is just that we can do that, that we can take them, swap sensors, put these things on their types of data. It's like having our own little satellite in our hands, and it's really amazing stuff. And we'll see some great example here of, of that in, in a minute. Uh, but some examples of data here's out here at AgriLife over Sorghum. We got near infrared here, and then we're zooming in with RGB, just showing that quality of resolution. This is a, just a, a rotary, a 4K or a, a, just a RGB camera, 4K camera on a DJI Phantom. But we also equipped it with an NIR sensor on it, a little small NIR sensor on a little DJI Phantom. So this gives us two extra bands. So we basically have a five-band sensor on a little DJI, which is which is amazing uh, to get at. And so we can do a lot with this data as we start to zoom in and do things. And again, you'll see some really neat examples of this data. Um, as an example here is another one from our fixed wing platform. So here's an RGB ortho mosaic. This is, here we are sitting in here somewhere. Um, this is going to the north, so I guess that's that way. This is RGBs from one flight. Here's an NIR reflectance map. So this is just stuff created out of that structure for motion processing workflow. Um, and then the thermal sensors. This is just showing differences in, in thermal radiated energy coming out. All this different information could be pieced together, and we could very, very incredible what we can get out of that data. Um, and then real quick, moving on, one other cool technology I'll mention here, I won't spend a lot, is LiDAR. So that's photogrammetry. LiDAR is an, a different style of technology. But this used to be very expensive putting in aircrafts. The sensors are getting smaller and smaller. But the basic idea with LiDAR is it's the same concept as taking cameras. We want to map in 3D. We want to get point clouds. So here's a point cloud of our LiDAR works is it uses a laser. So instead of a camera and passively sensing, it just shoots out a laser very, very fast, hundreds of thousand pulses a second. What it does then is it fires a laser. A laser here, it hits the wall and comes back. If I can time how accurately it takes for that laser to go from here to there and back, if I can time that and do it really, really well, I can take that and convert it to a distance. And then if I can figure out the GPS location of where my sensor is and its orientation, I convert that distance into a 3D coordinate on the ground. And ultimately, what I can get is a point cloud, just like we did with the, with the photogrammetry and the drones um, with the structure from motion. So here's an example of a LiDAR using a mobile LiDAR actually mounted on a car of our campus um, that we get. But what we do is we can strap these sensors traditionally in an airplane, and we have the GPS up here and, the, and an orient fly along, and we scan really, really fast. We can convert those measurements again into these, these point clouds. Um, but what's really cool about LiDAR and what's different with this for, oops, so that's my timer. So to end here, what's really cool about LiDAR, what's different is they both give you 3D point clouds, but the structure for motion is photogrammetry. What's powerful about LiDAR and really what has a lot of folks in crop science very interested is this multi-return capability. What happens with LiDAR is for a given laser pulse coming out, that energy could hit the top of the canopy, get a measurement there. Some of that energy keeps going, hits the middle of the canopy, we get a, and then finally it hits here, and then maybe it hits the bottom. So we can get, for one laser pulse, what we call multi-return or multi-echo detection. Or that structure for motion, we would just have that pixel wherever it's located, and we just get one measurement. So this is very, very powerful. Um, and what it allows us to do is we can simultaneously strip away to get ground, but we can also pull out canopy heights. So this is just a case where this is complete force, but I stripped it away, taking last returns. I reconstructed the canopy height here. But it turns out it just gives us more information on top of canopy, middle, and below. Um, and we can collect that data and get a better reconstruction of what's going on at developments compared to, say, the photogrammetry approach. Um, and what's cool about it is now these are making their way onto drones. So real quick, here's one of our systems we have here. This is actually a very powerful LiDAR system. Um, it's got a over a 1,000 meter range. We have it in a uh, UAS system here. It's a pretty big platform. It's just so it is considered a small UAS. We just integrated it now. These are some of our, some of our students in here today putting on a Wi-Fi mount. Here's our platform. We fly it with a Sony PlayStation joystick. But here it is flying. Um, the sensor isn't in here because it's too windy. We didn't want to risk that LiDAR sensor because it's a very expensive LiDAR sensor. 
Um, finally, real quick, here I am carrying the system, moving it around with the actual LiDAR sensor in it firing because it was too windy that day to try to fly it. Um, we just got this and are just integrating it, but here's an actual point cloud from this LiDAR sensor drone from me walking around in our campus and getting it. Um, but the real power of this is, again, is this type of information, the miniaturization, this was just not possible five years ago to have in drones, ten years ago. It's really the, like the automated car industry and things that have pushed this technology down to where these sensors are getting small enough to put in UAS. And there's much smaller sensors that can be integrated and get this data, but very, very powerful for, for agriculture and crop science integrating this information. So I'll stop. Um, you'll see some excellent examples from Dr. Jung coming up on how that data is used, and we'll see you later today.